um, Lorraine's project is on um, grandparents who bring their children to church. And as a first time grandmother myself, I can just tell you, it's about the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> tell you what. And I have the absolute cutest grandchild that's ever been born. One year, almost one year old. <laughs> We're gonna get in a fight now, aren't we? <laughs> Them's fighting words. But, um, and uh, um, I, I think I'm going to have to be the one to uh, take him to church because my children, my, my daughter and her husband don't go to church. But um, that's going to be a rather long commute since they live in Williamsburg, Virginia. <laughs> but anyway, I will, I will, I will do anything with Levi. I, I think I will. <laughs> But anyway, um, you might not know that Lorraine writes books about hedgehogs. Did you know that? For children. But anyway, her um, project, One Generation from Extinction, this is really interesting because um, she could find almost no literature about this phenomenon. But I've, no it's a, I've noticed it a lot um, in churches where I've been that you see grandparents bringing their uh, children, grandchildren to church. And um, uh, grandparents being the, having the primary responsibility for influencing their grandchildren in terms of um, their faith formation and so forth. So um, I think CBC uh, News interviewed you because this is something that they recognize. And, and several other of our uh, students have been um, have been interviewed by the yeah. media as well because of their um, uh, cutting edge projects. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lorraine. Thank you very much. And I am so glad to see people here. So many people came up and apologized that they couldn't be here this afternoon. I had this vision of Dr. Will Hawk, maybe the dean, and me. <laughs> so. Back when I was a young mother and both teaching Sunday school and bringing my own kids to church, we had to rent a school building to have enough classrooms for the children. The parents and grandparents were in the auditorium at the service while the kids were in class. We all came together at communion. Just showed you how old I am, doesn't it? Many years later, in another parish, but still a Sunday school teacher, I noticed that things had changed. Gradually, the number of children diminished, classes combined, shrank, and all but disappeared. The people who were bringing the kids to church had changed too. By the time I left that parish to start my studies here at AST, the children in my class, all three of them, were being brought to Sunday school by their grandparents. I thought maybe it was just a local peculiarity. Maybe it was just that our neighborhood was getting older. School assigned me to another parish, very different from my home parish. And once again, I noticed there were a number of children in the church there with their grandparents, usually their grandmother. In both of my summer placements, it, the grandparents were still there with the kids, but the parents weren't. Was this just a, you know, a coincidence, or was it a more general trend? I started asking my friends, both lay and clergy, and usually the response I got was, now that you mention it, there are a couple of grandparents in my church who are bringing the kids. I was curious. Why were they the ones bringing the kids? Where were the parents? Why weren't they there? If the grandparents were bringing the kids to the church, were they doing anything else to teach the faith? If the parents didn't go to church, were they, the grandparents, doing anything differently this time? It's so many questions. So there it was, the beginning of my research project. In the beginning, I was going in so many different directions that I could have spent the next 20 years asking questions and compiling data. I really wanted to know if these grandparents would be successful, not only in teaching their grandchildren the faith, 
but instilling in them the desire to come to church on their own. I knew that one of my friends had been brought to church by her grandparents, and she was particularly close to her grandfather. She is studying to be a priest, so was it something that her grandparents had done to set the foundation? Or was it God calling her as God called the young Samuel? I wanted to understand what the experience was like for both the grandparents and the children. What were the theological implications for the church? Is there a hope of spreading the gospel to this youngest generation? One thing I learned early on, as Susan said, there has been very little research. Every book and article that I found was either about grandparents raising their grandchildren as a result of their own children's death or It missed a page. <laughs> As a result of their own children's death or severe addiction. I wanted to know more. But anyway, they, these books would tell you how to be a good grandparent without stepping on your children's toes. It was telling the parents of young children, cultivate the grandparents for things like emergency babysitting, picking up sick kids at school. Many, many books had cute pictures and trite poems that sentimentalized the relationship. How wonderful it is to have grandchildren, and it is. And how wonderful it is to have a grandparent, and it is. If we are going to have a Christian church in the future, we need to teach our children about God the way, and the way that God would have us live in this world. And why should a grandparent take on this task? According to scripture, grandparents have a vital role in the transfer of faith from one generation to another. From Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 and 2, slightly abridged. These are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy a long life. Second Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you also. All of the synoptic gospels record Jesus' command to not hinder the children. From Luke 18, verse 16, let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. A grandparent who loves God and his church will long to share that love with their precious grandchildren. So, this is my research question. What is the experience of grandparents who take their grandchildren to church, serving as their primary religious educators? I use the qualitative research method of phenomenology to gather data from the participants, because phenomenology assumes that there is shared essence or essences in shared experience. In examining people's lived experience and letting them share their own stories, I hope to identify what is at the heart of this phenomenon, to know if it can teach us anything and where it can lead us as a church. I went to look for volunteers for my study. I emailed letters to a number of clergy with the details of my project and asked them to give my contact information to any of their congregants who were interested. Both of my advisors sent my information to people who were interested in the topic and word spread. In the beginning, I got many more emails and phone calls from people who wanted to hear the details, the, res the results of my study, than I did from people wanting to take part in the study. In the end, I did seven interviews with a total of nine people. There were seven women and two men. Two of the women were widowed. 
All of the others were married, but only two of the grandfathers were regular in attending church. And both of these men are very actively involved in teaching the faith to their grandchildren. One grandfather comes to church on occasion, but leaves the church stuff to his wife. My participants ranged in age from 50 to the mid 80s, and their grandchildren were from nine months to 33 years old. That's a pretty significant age. Grandchildren were a mix of boys and girls, but the boys were either older and off on their own, or still in the toddler stage. They came from five different churches and three different denominations, but the, they were Anglican United and Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholic grandparents had, in both cases, moved to an Ang one an Anglican and one a United Church because they couldn't find what they were looking for in their own church. So I thought that was quite interesting. The churches were in rural, small town, suburban, and city environments. I gave each participant the choice of a place for the interview, and all but one chose to bring me to their home. The Cape Breton interview I conducted and recorded over the phone. Each was looking forward to talking about their time with their grandchildren. All the names are pseudonyms chosen by the participants. The interviews consisted of eight questions with some clarifying questions to get at the heart of the experience. The data analysis showed some very strong common themes, and these are what I will focus on in this presentation. So my question, why are you the person taking your grandchildren to church, and why do you want to do this? Who are these people, my participants? All of the women and men that I interviewed are very active in their church. This is a list of some of the things that they have done. All but two of my participants are retired, and all but one of them babysits their grandchildren at least once a week. All of them brought their own children to church and to Sunday school. None of these adult children now attend church on any regular basis. Some will come on special occasions, like Christmas and Easter, as a gift to their parent. Some are slowly returning to church on a slightly more regular basis. Some have a very negative view of church, but not necessarily of faith. I was surprised that several of the parents wanted the grandparents to take the kids to church. They just didn't want to go themselves. One mother said, you made us go to church in Sunday school. If you want, you can take my girls. <laughs> I want them to have the same kind of foundation that I do. A couple of the grandmothers babysit their grandchildren when their children work on the weekend. If they were not allowed to bring the grandchildren to church, they would have to miss church themselves. And for Naomi, this was part of her bargaining strategy. She and one other grandparent have had to make promises not to sneak off and get the child baptized. I don't know what they think is going to happen. But Maggie told them, told me, I've had them since they were babies, and I was allowed to take them. When she was first pregnant, my younger daughter told me, Mom, I know it's your thing, but I'm not having my baby baptized. I know that her sister had her baby baptized, but it's just not my thing. I didn't say nothing. I said to myself, oh, yes, you will. The seed's been planted, and you will. Then, when she was about eight months pregnant, and her sister was pregnant with my youngest grandchild, she comes to me and she says, Mom, so-and-so, my best friend's going to be the godmother, and Em and me were having a double baptism. <laughs> and they did, and now I take them every week. My girls call me up and ask, and I just say, have them ready at such and such a time, and off we go. Jane said, my granddaughter was about two, and I wanted to take her to church with us. She's quite full of beans, high energy, never sleeps, and they are tired most of the time, the parents are. So they were quite delighted if there are a couple of hours on a Sunday morning that are quieter at home. My son said to me, Mom, you can take her to the mosque. 
You can take her to the synagogue. You can take her to the church. We don't care, but just take her. <laughs> some grandparents take some of their grandchildren, but they're not allowed to take the others, and this is a little hurtful for them. Maggie told me, I don't know. My son had the same upbringing as my girls. The seed was planted, but his wife doesn't like church, and he says it's up to her. My granddaughter asks me, Nana, can I come to church with you? And I say, I'll call your mother. I do, and she's like, no, not this week, maybe next week. And next week it's the same thing, so I kind of gave up. And sometimes it's the grandchild who asks to go to church. Martha told me, she must have been four because she'd just started kindergarten. And she'd come up and asked to go to church with her grandpa and me. Her parents didn't mind. All of my participants talked about the need to be respectful of the rules that the parents had set out. None of them assume that they may take the grandchildren. They check every week. Mary told me, they all have their own way of doing things and I have to respect that. I don't want to, but I have to. Some of my participants have had to be particularly tactful as one or both parents are distrustful of the church and religion. One daughter-in-law allows the child's grandmother to take her to church because she is their full-time babysitter, but she wants nothing to do with church. She said, the moment she comes home and tells me that the church said that you have to do this or that, that's the moment she stops going to church. All of the participants are very faithful people and want their children and grandchildren to have the faith that they have. Some of them stop going to church for a time in their early 20s, but they never stop believing in God or the importance of church. All of them were brought to church and Sunday school by their families, and three of them talked about their father's faith in particular. They all talked about wanting their grandchildren and their children to have something to help them in hard times. Naomi and Mary and Marcel talked about their children wanting their kids to make up their own minds. They convinced their children that the little ones needed to go to church to have the information that they will need in order to make up their minds when they're older. So, what do you and the children get out of this experience? As you might expect, all of the grandparents love having the grandchildren with them. Dorcas said, well, I just enjoy being with them. I enjoy having them and it's my time with them. I think that sounds selfish, but that's about the size of it. Others talked about making this a special time with their grandchildren and getting to show them off to their church family. They either have the children for a sleepover on Saturday night or they bring them home for most of Sunday. They all had wonderful smiles when talking about this time with their grandchildren. Some talked about the satisfaction of doing their duty and all talked about how happy they were making sure the kids had a firm foundation and in the faith and that they were planting the seeds. These two images came up again and again and again as I talked to the grandparents, both about their grandchildren and their own children. All of the grandparents were proud of how much the children were learning and how much they looked forward to going to church. Naomi said that her granddaughter has her church dress picked out on Monday morning, and Jane's granddaughter told her, told her to bring her little brother. Don't be so mean, Grandma. Let him come. He's just turned two. They are pleased with the kinds of questions that these kids are asking, both of them and of their parents. Jane said she asks her father questions when she goes home. I was quite surprised. She has discussions with her dad, and I don't get into it. 
I'm just delighted that he will answer the questions so I don't push. The grandparents believe that the children are learning to love the Lord and to know who Jesus is. They are comfortable in church and know many of the prayers and hymns and sing them at home. Two of the families had deaths in the last year. Both of those grandmothers believe that the children coped better with the deaths, one of an aunt, one of a, grandf and one of a grandfather, and one of a, grand, uh, a great-grandmother. They cope better because they know that this life is not all there is, that death is the beginning of a new life. A young man whose mother died told his grandmother how glad he was to know that his mother was okay now, that she was with God. Both spoke of how glad they were to see the peace that faith gave both their children and grandchildren during this difficult time. Doris just told me, it's such a blessing to be able to take my grandchildren to church. I'm every bit as excited as they are. I love going to church and having the children just adds to the joy. One of the most important parts of the experience for both the grandparents and the children is the attitude of the churches. All welcome children, but three of the five have made special efforts to involve the children. Two of the churches have removed the pews from the back of the church and put a comfortable seating area with rugs and soft toys and quiet activities like coloring sheets. The children and grandparents both love this area. They can be part of the service without having to sit still. And because they don't have to sit still, the children tend to be quiet. Four of the five churches offer communion to children as soon as they are baptized. Seven of the 11 children are regular communicants. Four have not been baptized, but they do go up to receive a blessing. Two of them are old enough to have asked why they can't have the bread. The grandparents have explained that mommy and daddy don't want them to be baptized yet, and they're okay with that for now. It's the grandparents who are sad. These churches all involve children with things like taking up the offertory, greeting people, handing out bulletins, and with the Sunday school, singing special songs to the congregation from time to time. The children feel at home with these people and with the services, and all of them are excited about going to church. It's no struggle. They're ready to go. So, do you think that your children still have faith? This was a hard question for me. How would they know if their children still had faith? And would it be hurtful for them to talk about it? They were all eager to talk about it. Even if it was hurtful, they were glad to have a sympathetic ear to listen. And of course, the answers vary. Two of the participants know that their children have faith because they have started to come to church from time to time, and they've also started to take a more active role in the education, the faith education of their own children. And I didn't even ask them to, said Jane. Two know that some of their children have faith, but they also know that one or two do not believe, and this worries them. Mary said, what have they got to hang on to when life gets hard? And you know life gets hard. Several said they didn't know if their children have faith. And a couple said they know they have faith because they talk about these things. Anne said, I just don't know why they don't get up and go to church. Mary worries that her son has lost his faith because he used to be a very active church member as a teen and now he won't have his children baptized. But her husband, Marcel, says that at least he asks them to pray for him when he's troubled, and he's still letting them take the children to church. But I want my children and grandchildren to have what I have, she says. I asked them, what is different with the grandkids 
What has changed since they took their own kids to church? Naomi told me, grandkids are totally different from your own children. Your expectations of them are totally different. Your time with them is totally different. You're much more relaxed with them. With your own kids, you're rushing around and expectations are higher and stuff. You're a lot more relaxed and a lot calmer the second time around. Both of the grandfathers and three of the grandmothers talked about the change in attitude of the churches. When my kids were little, they had to be quiet and sit still. People would shush them and glare at you until you either got them to be quiet or took them out of the church. Marcel said, he, the priest, got so red in the face, he'd lose his teeth so angry he'd get. <laughs> That's such a vivid picture for me. <laughs> With a very strong French accent. So what is it like now? As I said, uh, three of my people who were Roman Catholic went to different churches. And they didn't leave the Catholic Church. They just needed a place where they felt they could take their grandchildren. I went there, and you were so welcomed. I've never sat alone. The people made me so welcome. They made the kids welcome. They don't mind if the kids make a little noise. Jane said they treat her like she's her own person. So. Is there anything that we can learn from this study? The first thing is that what these grandparents are doing matters. Being non-judgmental and res respecting their children's parenting and values, they have been able to bring their grandchildren to church and Sunday school, and they've been able to teach them the Christian story. They are reminding their children of what they were taught and this is drawing some of them back to the church. Even those who do not come back to the faith are still willing to let their children learn about the faith. What the churches do matters. Three of the five churches have made extra efforts to involve the children in the service and to make them feel welcome and part of the church family. By the time the children in these churches start Sunday school, they're already at home, both with the liturgies and in the congregation. They have developed their own relationships with people of all ages, not just with their grandparents' friends. All of my participants told me how much the children love the priest or minister at their church. These children feel that they are special to these clergy. Some of the things that my participants thought the church should do, be welcoming, not gushy, include children in the liturgy, include children in communion, include children in church work, don't mind a little noise, help clergy to be comfortable with children. None of my participants feel that they have any special gifts or training that helps them teach the faith to their grandchildren. They just love the Lord, love the church, and love to bring these children to everything that they do in and with the church and its programs. They live their faith in all that they do, and it shows. They plant the seeds. Dr. Dean told a group of grandparents at a local Roman Catholic church about my project, and the chair of that group arranged to meet with me. These people meet together on a regular basis to discuss ways and means that might help them reach their unchurched grandchildren. They are frustrated both because they can't find research that they're looking for, and they feel that the hierarchy of the church should be funding grandparent training to help them bring the lost generation, their words, back to church. They have been told that the church needs to focus on the young, that this is where the money for teaching has to go. Their generation already has the faith. They interpret this as, you are nearly dead, you are too old to do any good, so go away. 
They hope that my findings will help them with their quest. I don't know if it will, but I will be meeting with them in April to discuss my findings. And the main thing that I will tell them, have patience with your children. Respect their role and views as parents. Use the special bond that you have with your grandchildren to talk to them. Negotiate what you can do, but don't push. Keep learning and growing in your own faith, and you will be the nourishment for the seeds that have been planted. Even when a building has fallen into disrepair, a strong foundation holds. Jesus is the cornerstone. And this is purely self-advertisement. <laughs> Old at that picture, and she's, she's a week and two days now. All right, second cutest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Ray. That um, I don't know very we interesting uh, phenomenon that's going on in our uh, in our church right now. Any questions for her? I'm going to choose my words carefully as my own parents stand next to me here who bring grandchildren to church. <laughs> um, you talked about your participants. Um, I believe you said some of the reasons that their own children stopped going to church were um, the partner didn't like to go to church or didn't have any faith background. And um, I didn't hear in there, did you have any instances where the children had had a bad experience um, or a misconnection or the, the grandparents felt like they'd not done some work that they needed to do with their own children. Was there any of that sense with any of your participants? They all felt they had done the best they could with what they knew at the time. And as I said, with the differences in the church then and now, they felt that a lot of having to sit still and be quiet and the very regimented idea. I mean, I got thrown out of church with all of my kids. I just got very stubborn. I, mean, I, left, I left the, ch the place, but not the church. Um, and they felt that had a lot to do with it. There was only one parent who really wondered because her son had been a very strong, active church member and he just stopped going. He will not tell her what happened. She really thinks something happened. And of course, with all of the, we're hearing about the priests, it was in a Roman Catholic church, he was an altar boy. She even asked him point blank, did anything happen with the priest? but he resents her for having taken him to church. So we, we did think there was something there, but there was nothing, we, I mean, I just talked and visited with them after for a while. She couldn't get anything out. All the rest of them felt that no, it was things like peer pressure, they got to be teenagers, and more things interfered. Getting teenagers up on Sunday morning is not the easiest thing to do. Um, so they felt it was more that. And then when they got married, um, one married somebody who really hates church, doesn't want anything to do with church, so he's kind of, he wouldn't mind going to church, but he doesn't want to have a fight with his wife. Another, they just don't want to get up in the morning. They're saying it's just working all week and being too tired and having kids who don't sleep. As I said, take her. <laughs> maybe when I wake up in five years, maybe then I'll come back. But there, it was more that. It wasn't any harm or scandal or anything like that. Lorraine, you mentioned that one of or some of the grandchildren were as old as 33. Yes. Um, I, I, a, lot of, a lot of the data that I felt like I heard was probably for the much younger yes. children. Can you expand a little bit on the kind of upper teenage, did they try to take their, their grandchildren to church and what was that like for them? Um, those children did go to church with their grandparents. In both cases, the children went to church with the grandparents when they were young. 
now that they're in the late teens. It, there was a big gap. My, the oldest in the still active going to church was 12. And the others were um, sort of early 20s to early 30s. And they were in the kind of away from church stage. But the, 30, the uh, young man who lost his mother, he's 33. And while he has not been actively going to church, while his mother was dying, she was diagnosed with a cancer and died fairly quickly, um, he did draw on his faith. So even though she, he wasn't attending church on a regular basis, he still had that foundation and that belief and that the system was, he was going to church a bit more when his mother was sick, but when he went back to his own work and so on, it kind of went back to the 33-year-old way of life. Um, so then a follow-up is what happens, you said the oldest was 12, do you have a sense of what happens in there? When, when the children start to, to get older and how they're responding there? Um, I was also, there were also a, cu a couple that I interviewed um, that were in later teens. Um, they seem to stay involved with the church until they leave home. They, it's just they weren't in that age group. Um, as I said, it was kind of funny because one grandmother has uh, an eight and a 12 year old and then she has a 25 year old grandchild. So there's that huge gap. Um, they're still involved, particularly if they were involved in things like choir or if they started teaching Sunday school themselves, which happens with some churches when they're about 12, 14, helping out. So they stayed involved until they went away to university. Just curious, Lorraine. Um, the grandparents who were taking their children to church, was it always in the same community that the children lived, or was it a situation where they were taking the children to a new community, and does that factor into later on them keeping going to church or not going to church because they're not with their friends, because their friends are back in their home commun uh, community? Um, all but one of them were within the same community. The church had changed since the, children had, since the children had been there, but they were in their home communities. Um, part of the problem with, with them for taking a couple of their other grandchildren is that they were too far away. And you can't on a Sunday morning drive from Dartmouth to the other side of Terrence Bay to pick up a grandchild to bring them to church. So they regretted that, but they were sort of felt they were doing what they could. Um, the one who was going out of the community, it was, um, they weren't going far out of the community, so they were still in the same school catchment area. So as young teenagers, they got back with their school friends. They were just in with a, yeah, they were in a different place for when they were, you know, in elementary and junior high. So it wasn't, I want to say thank you first. Uh, you know, I think that's absolutely groundbreaking research, and I'm so glad that you've done it. And I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. I think we have to go a lot further with this. Um, but in terms of Shirley's question, I've talked to some parents who bring their children to a church that's outside of their home community because that's the parents' home church. So, you know, they'll leave their home area and bring the children there. And they say to the kids, it's no different than going out to a soccer team. It's a different group of friends, but it's just a different group of friends. Children adjust to that fine, so it doesn't seem to present any issues. Thanks, Lorraine. As someone who hopes someday to be a grandparent, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for this. Um, I know the UCC is kind of constantly involved in this reworking of our worship and our community to attract younger people, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm hearing in what the parents are saying about why their kids don't go to church, almost a blaming the children, not the institution, right? 
you know, not, not, so I'm wondering if you could um, sort of expand on the idea of the reasons why, and do these grandparents who see their children not wanting to come to church ever think there's something wrong with the church, that's why they're not coming, or is it always my kids just don't care about it anymore? No. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a fine line. They don't, they don't want to blame their kids because they really do, deep in their heart of hearts, believe that, as I said, the seed's been planted. There's a firm foundation. That came up again and again. That there is still faith in the child. What they're, who's probably your age, my age, right? Um, but what they're seeing is that the churches themselves have changed. <laughs> Society has changed from when their kids were little. Their kids, as I said, they had to stay still. There was this structure. A couple of grandparents were saying, well, my kid never actually went to church. They came and they were right down in the basement for Sunday school. So when they came time, Sunday school was over. They hadn't a clue about being in church. They'd never been, except Christmas Eve and maybe Easter when, well, you know what a Christmas Eve service is like, it's pure bedlam, it's wonderful, but it's bedlam and it's not normal church. So they were saying, that one of the things that they were saying is that the idea of having the child in church before Sunday school. So these, most of these grandparents were taking the two-year-olds. One said, as, as soon as he's potty trained because his parents don't believe in diapers, so, and their church has no running water, so they weren't bringing the two-year-old until, until either the church got water or he was out of diapers, or he was in diapers. In that. <laughs> so they're bringing the little ones so the little ones get a chance to sit in church and absorb what the, a church service is. <laughs> Thanks, Lorraine. It's been very helpful. Now, um, what have the grandparents learned that they're now going to do with their grandchildren that they didn't do with their own children? They have a lot more patience. They don't have the same really high expectations. With their children, they expected them, again, like the whole society, they expected them to be able to sit still. They expected it to be easy to get out the door on Sunday morning. And I can tell you, with four kids, between newborn and seven, getting them out the door on Sunday morning is nothing short of a miracle. But they had really, really high expectations of themselves and of their children. And with their grandchildren, well, just about anything their grandchild does is cute. Their grandchildren are brilliant. They're three years old and they know, they can repeat what the priest says, right? You know, they can join in with the priest. The whole, their whole attitude is different. And looking back, if they could have had that kind of attitude with their own children, they think that maybe that it would have taken better, that maybe the children would have been more relaxed, more comfortable themselves. So sort of the two things, knowing how to be in church rather than just Sunday school, and having your parents relax. So in part, it's about their redemption. Yes, it is. Of course it is. Everything's about redemption. So are the, um, are the grandchildren evangelizing, going home and evangelizing their children? They are. They're going I mean, they're, their parents? Parents. <laughs> They are. From what they're, they're learning going, in church, are they going home going and talking? They're going home and asking their parents questions. Like, um, Daddy, do you have a Bible? I need a Bible for Sunday school. Well, yes, I actually do. Well, you know, so he went up and got the Bible, and his mother just about fell over, and you have a Bible? <laughs> um, the, kids ask, the kids ask questions. They tell them, they go in, you know, a four-year-old running in the house tells Mommy and Daddy everything, all of them. <laughs> So they're hearing what's going on in church. They're not hearing judgment and sin and damnation. They're hearing love and joy and, wow, this is so exciting. Let me tell you what happened. I'll tell you a little story. One of my, one of my people 
has, she says, all her grandchildren are special, but this little one, she told her grandmother that God sent her down from heaven because, because she needed her. And she says, she went home and she told her mom, she says, Mom, I spent all of today up in heaven with Jesus, and we had a tea party, and this is, Jesus wore my crown with me, and we had a, we had a princess tea party, Jesus and I. And she says, you can tell the child believes it thoroughly. She's three. You know, so with that overwhelming love and singing, singing songs about Jesus in the grocery store, and so yeah, they're going back. And a couple of them are seeing that their kids are starting to say, okay, maybe with my kid having so much fun and enjoying it so much, maybe I need to see a little bit about, if, you know, if maybe I would be not so, maybe it would not be so bad to go occasionally. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering, did any of the grandparents um, have uh, any inkling or recognition, I guess, of um, the idea that um, sometimes people do have to fall away before they can come back? And because we hear about Dante, right, and uh, his midlife crisis, as it were. But um, is it, was there an understanding of that, that um, that you figured out or saw that uh, they had an understanding of that phenomenon? Or do people seem to expect that because they had this uh, foundation that, that, that there should be no break in it? No, actually all of the grandparents expected that their grandchildren would take a break. They figured late teens, early 20s, they would probably take a break because that would be the time when they were questioning and so on. And you know, is, what is it they said about C.S. Lewis and Narnia? We either have to be young enough or you have to be old enough. You wouldn't be caught dead reading Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when you're 17. But when you're 70, you read it, it's wonderful. When you're seven, it's wonderful. So they all had that kind of understanding that there would be a break. But what was concerning them was when the break was going on too long. It seems to me that uh, I can really see that grandparents would get a lot out of this type of uh, activity. In your uh, research, what do you think the children got out of all this? The children had a wonderful time. They were the center of grandma or grandma and grandpa's attention. All of the grandparents made it really special. As I said, they would either have them over. One grandmother said, I bribed them. She says, whatever they want for supper, whatever books they want to read, we, you know, Saturday night is so special. And then they go to church. And church is fun. Church is fun. So the kids have fun in church. They get to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. They get to meet new people. They get to meet their church friends. They get to do, sing songs, hear stories. So having special time with grandma and grandpa. Now, I was not so lucky. My parents were orphans, so I didn't really know grandparents. And I'll tell you, I fell in love with my ex-husband's grandparents long before I fell in love with him. <laughs> you know, it was so great to have a grandparents. Now, th there is a special relationship, and the grandparents who use that relationship without abusing it are the ones who are being successful. If you're trying to make your grandchild guilty because the grandchild doesn't want to come over right now, I mean, one grandmother said, and she says, when, I'm, when we're alone together, we have a wonderful time. When she's at, she's, I think she's seven, she says, there were, I was at her house for a birthday party and all her friends from school were there, so I totally expected that I'd be, that I'd be Nana on the other side of the room. You know, she, she wants to acknowledge me, but n not when, my, when her friends are around. So it was that kind of thing. But there is that special. Uh, Lorraine, you mentioned uh, that you heard a, a fairly, well, a common assumption among your respondents that these children were going to come to a point in their life when they would inevitably leave the church. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think underneath that is there, I'm hearing an assumption that the main purpose of 
childhood faith formation is to give someone something to rely on when life goes bad in their adult life. I wonder why, and I wonder what your thoughts are about this, although this may just turn out to be a rhetorical question. The, the grandparents who have great hopes for their grandchildren cannot imagine that this changed church could be a place where these children, when they reach young adulthood, could find answers for their questions and the freedom to ask those questions. There seems to me to be still, this, still the assumption that while they recognize the church has changed, the end result of faith formation of their, of their grandchildren will be the same as it was for their children. They're, they're thinking it will, but they're hoping it won't. They're hoping that there will be enough continuing change in the church to allow these children to grow through and with the church. But they're also comforting themselves, I think looking at their own children, saying, okay, I can see that maybe they're gonna start coming back to church and now that this new church is so much nicer and the kids are having so much more fun and that we're not fighting all the time, trying to get them out the door, that maybe, maybe this time it will go through. Um, they, they do feel that the world is so powerful that there are so many other influences out there in high school and university that when the kids go out and they are in such a minority, most of their friends have never been inside the door of a church. They're seen as strange and weird sometimes for having attended a church. And I'm not, they're, they're thinking that they're not sure that there's anything there that will help the kids get through that without having to leave and grow up a little bit and be able to take on for themselves. Well, yeah, church is still important to me. It doesn't matter that my friends think I'm weird. I'm gonna go anyway. So uh, Im imagine then what the church might offer grandparents in their, in their own ongoing faith formation as communicators of the faith, what might the church offer you when Constance reaches the age mm -hmm. where she begins to wonder if there's a place for her as she continues to grow and, and, and model then that this church is a place where you have the freedom to question and stretch things, but you don't have to leave to do that. Well, I think that is the big thing as uh, John was saying about the men who leave the church, we need room for people to question and grow and doubt. If, you, if the church is open and it's understood that it's okay to ask the questions, to be like doubting Thomas and say, I'm not gonna believe it unless I can put my finger in the side and put my finger in the hole in his hand, I'm not gonna believe it. If the church can be open and be seen to be open to dealing with these questions and allowing that flexibility and freedom. I think that we might manage to keep young people through the teen years. But if they, if they think that, so I think teaching the grandparents that and letting, the, and letting the grandparents know that it is okay if their teenagers are going to be argumentative and doubtful and argue, argue you up one side and down the other. You know, I remember my kids doing that. And you think they can ask more questions than you can ever hope to answer. So you need to be able to say, okay, I don't necessarily have the answer, but it's okay for you to keep looking for the answer and I'll help you find it. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you, Lorraine. You'll have to talk with her later, Thank Holly. You. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, I know, I think the, um, Lawrence's question and, and, and your project really represents a leadership question, yeah. a challenge to our, to our leadership um, uh, of how we will break open the gospel to allow the Holy Spirit to continue to work in the lives of people throughout the life cycle. Thank you very much.